Okay, so hi everyone and uh, welcome to this webinar. Here's uh, Jonathan. Once again, I will be your host for today's session. Um, so today we will visit a case study with our panelists uh, on decision model creation and deployment using DMM. So if uh, you were uh, with us on the webinar last month, we had Bruce Silver explaining uh, what is DMN and how it goes further than, uh, than business rules management. And we also uh, were able to see uh, how it provides a visual interface designed for, for business users. So today we go a step further by adding the model deployment aspect. And this is where you will see that DMN is not only simple, a simpler alternative, but also something uh, powerful. But before that, uh, let me just go, go quickly uh, over a few things. Uh, first, I'll take a couple minutes to introduce Trizatech. Um, after that, Vipo will step in and uh, present the case study. Uh, this will be followed by a demo by uh, Simon Reguet, our solution architect. Uh, at any time during the presentation, you may have some questions. So uh, if so, just please use the questions widget of the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we'll, we'll have time at the end uh, to get to your questions. Uh, last thing, uh, we are currently recording the webinar, uh, which means we will also provide a link to it. So don't worry if you miss any part, or if you have to leave early, uh, you'll have the opportunity to watch it again and even share it with colleagues. So very briefly, uh, for those that might not know uh, Trizatech, uh, we're a so software solution provider. Uh, our tool is called the Digital Enterprise Suite. It's composed of various components, uh, all of which not only bringing the, uh, the efficiency and effectiveness uh, aspect, but uh, also helping businesses become more agile in delivering customer experience. Today's session is based on the Trizatech Decision Management Solution. Uh, the modeling tool that you will see is uh, our DMN modeler. It's super intuitive, easy to use for both business and technical users. Uh, decisions can then be uh, transformed into decision services, it can be published through the whole architecture using the cloud execution and available through the service library. So let me introduce today's panelists, uh, Vipul Kashyap. Vipul is a clinical information systems and enterprise information architect. Uh, he's an experienced uh, healthcare informatic, in, informatics executive with extensive experience ac across payers, providers, and pharmaceuticals. Uh, he was director of clinical decision support and care management at a major healthcare provider network. Uh, in this session, uh, he will share his experience in the creation and deployment of decision models using DMN. Uh, the case study is ba based on his work as an early adopter of DMN for uh, implementation of clinical decision support. So that's just the context of the uh, the case study that we will visit today. Uh, and then we will have uh, Simon uh, coming to demonstrate how this was done. So have a great session, everyone. And uh, I will be back at the end uh, to uh, manage the questions. So Vipul, uh, you have control now. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction, John, Jonathan. Uh, I'm going to discuss how we can leverage uh, the emerging DMN model for clinician-friendly rules authoring. Um, uh, so a few words about myself. I am uh, an experienced health informatics executive. Um, I was a fellow at the National Library of Medicine. I've had executive positions at peers like Cigna, providers uh, like Partners Healthcare, NYU Langone, and Northwell Health. And I worked on a whole slew of uh, what one may loosely characterize as AI kind of stuff, uh, clinical decision support, predictive modeling, clinical workflows, EMRs, HIE, interoperability, clinical knowledge management. And then um, I had a previous life where I was not in healthcare. Uh, before I came to healthcare, I worked for um, uh, Microelectronics and Computer Technology Corporation, which was an R&D cons consortium created in the 80s to, uh, uh, you know, um, to address the challenges by the Japanese fifth generation project. Uh, and then I worked uh, at Bell Communications Research on business rule systems and machine learning. 
Uh, in my talk, I, even though the talk is very clinical in nature, I will try to allude to uh, non-clinical ways of looking at it. So the agenda for today is a small, uh, a brief definition of what clinical decision support is. Um, we'll talk about a specific architecture on using which clinical decision support can be deployed uh, for electronic medical records. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the whole life cycle of creating CDS logic and artifacts, and then use this life cycle to step through a demo and an example of how we how we created DMN models and deployed them in um, stage and production. And this will be followed by a demo of uh, invoking the same DMN model which I demoed, uh, which I will show you guys uh, in the context of a clinical workflow. Uh, this will be done by Simon. And he will also show how you could uh, show the auditing of a DMN model in that context. Moving on. Um, so what is clinical decision support? Um, it's basically decision support at the point of care. So whenever a patient visits uh, a, a clinic, um, this, this is a CDS logic which triggers in response to certain events and uh, gives uh, feedback uh, and recommendations to a, a physician and a clinician and a staff, et cetera. So one of the things you could say is if a clinician is ordering a medication um, and the, the medication doesn't go well with the, the patient, that is the patient pro probably potentially has an allergy or a, a contraindication, uh, the clinical decision support would uh, trigger an alert to the physician to remind him of the fact one example of clinical decision support is called LACE score. This identifies patients at risk for readmission or death within 30 days of discharge. Um, and the output, so at, at the point of care, the CDS logic is invoked and the score helps the care coordinator make decisions about the care plan and outreach for a discharged patient. Okay. Um, this is the architecture. So, as you can see uh, on the left hand side, with number one, uh, this is a, a scenario where a medication order is entered into the electronic. The physician prescribes Toprol XL 50 milligram to a patient. As soon as uh, uh, this order is entered into the system, it triggers something called a CDS hook. The CDS hook invokes a remote service. This is identified as number two. Uh, this, uh, the, the, this architecture then basically prefetches all the data from the EHR fire server um, into, uh, into the service and then in, and executes the service and returns what is called as a set of CDS cards. So this is how the architecture and protocol for CDS hooks is defined. Uh, one of uh, one type of a card is an information card, which it just give information about, hey, you know, um, this this drug will cost two hundred dollars per month. The uh, other is uh, a recommendation card, where uh, you know where the recommendation could be, hey, instead of hey physician, instead of prescribing Toprol, can you switch to another drug? Uh, and this I have figured out based on the patient data and the the, the, the knowledge I have. And uh, finally, um, you can, the third kind of card you can give is a link card, an app link card where you can, the physician can link into, uh, press a link and invoke something called a smart on fire app, which is kind of beyond the scope of the stock and get more information about the decision which has been returned. As you can see, if you focus on number two in the diagram, this CDS service is implemented at the back end by a DMN engine on the cloud. Uh, the DMN engine is available, uh, is invoked via a REST API. Uh, and uh, what is passed to the DMN engine is the patient data and the model, I, uh, the model ID or URL, which needs to be invoked. And the DMN engine r runs the results, uh, runs the model and returns the results. Okay. so. So I, I talked about how a CDS model is deployed at the point of care. 
but creating the but the logic to create a cds model can be very complex it can be maybe maybe 40 to 52 sometimes hundreds of rules so it is not a one and done deal one has to follow uh, what i call as a clinical decision support life cycle so this is what the life cycle is um, somewhere someone writes creates the cds logic requirements now in the old days it was written on a piece of paper but now in the dmn context you can use the dmn model itself to to, to specify the requirements once the DMN model, uh, a high level DMN model is created, uh, one may call it as level one, uh, then uh, one can, uh, if you have a DMN repository uh, with all the models stored in your enterprise, you can, the first thing is, okay, you can reuse your, use your enterprise data model for the data elements which feed into the DMN model. So one thing uh, at the enterprise level, we have to be very careful is that all the DMN models have common data definitions and a common set of variables which feed into them. Otherwise, it, become, it becomes very difficult to reuse and repurpose pieces and parts of the DMN model. Once uh, we have ensured that the inputs of this new DMN model is, uh, is created by standardized data elements, then we can search a repository for pre-existing decisions and decision services uh, and reuse them as sub-decisions in our new model. Uh, we can also search for pre-curated concept sets. Now, this is something which is specific probably to healthcare, but it may exist in other domains as well, where um, we have ICD-10 and, uh, and RX norm and uh, CPT codes, and Typically, a collection of ICD-10 codes would indicate uh, a disease such as diabetes. Now, once these sets are defined, one, one need not define them again and again. They can be stored in a common place and reused across multiple models. And the final approach of uh, reusing is using parameterized function. Now, uh, in healthcare, a very common pattern is that you all you are always interested in the last test result of a particular type. So I'm always say interested in my last or most recent blood pressure reading or my last or most recent lab result. Now instead of implementing the logic to to step through a, a set of results and retrieve the last result, one can implement it as a function. Uh, and it can be used by uh, specifying certain parameters. So once the model is built out, uh, once these uh, reuse elements are identified, then you author the model, you refine and test the model, and you keep on iterating till you are till you are uh, happy with it. Now this is the best part: both authoring the model and refining and testing the model can be done by a business analyst or in the healthcare context, one would call it a clinical informaticist. Uh, a clinical informaticist in the healthcare context is someone who, uh, who works very closely for the physician or is a physician himself. Uh, he's not into, his role is not necessarily caring for the patients that much, uh, but he's more into designing the logic and, um, and understanding the different types of diseases and how they're represented in information systems. Um, so this is, uh, uh, this is very close to a business analyst. And the key part here is this piece can be done by a clinical informaticist without involving the IT developer. Uh, then the model is published uh, with metadata for cataloging so that in the future, when you want to reuse some part of it, you can search for it. Then it is deployed for execution and operational auditing. This is something we'll demonstrate towards the end of the talk through CDS hooks. And um, this is the key. Uh, this is the piece where IT can take a DMN model and work, work out the detailed, complex technical issues of uh, integrating it with the enterprise systems. And finally, uh, you can operationally evaluate the model, false positives, false negatives, and so on. 
Now what we will do is we will step through this life cycle and show you an actual demonstration of how a model is created. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about authoring the DMN model. In particular, um, we will talk about um, the LACE model, how we went about authoring it. Now, before we adopted DMN, this is we used a rules based rules language to capture the LACE model. And as you can see, the LACE model actually is not that simple. Uh, what you see is just a top level rule, which basically it uh, sums up four scores L A L A L score, LACE, A score, LACE, C score, LACE, E score, LACE. But each of these scores are then computed by other rules, which you see on the left hand side. There are around four decision tables. There are multiple guided rules which compute subparts of the model and so on and so forth. Uh, whereas this view is okay for an IT developer or a Java developer to understand, uh, it, was, it was pretty clear that uh, someone like a business analyst or someone like a clinical informaticist in the healthcare context would, would not be able to understand uh, this this view uh, without having uh, good technical knowledge. Now let me show you how the same model looks in DMN. I'm going to open up my browser, and this is the same model uh, which I showed you, which appeared as a complicated set of rules, uh, which uh, which is uh, uh, in DMN, right? So as you can see. The top decision is the LACE score. It has four component decisions, A score, C, L score, E score, and C score. I can show you uh, the logic for the LACE score. Um, I can probably do attributes, decision logic. And it's a simple summation of the sub decisions. Okay. Now, as you can see, um, uh, the first uh, the first thing we need see is that we see the whole model at one go. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, one can see very easily. Uh, this is uh, this view is very amenable to a business analyst or a clinical informaticist. That hey, now I want to do look at the L score, okay? And I can open the L score and look at the decision table. And I can see, huh, the L score actually depends on the length of the stay, the, the length that, uh, of stay of the patient in the hospital. And basically uh, what these rows are telling you is that if the duration is between P0D, this is a DMN way of saying duration, uh, it, it is zero. If it is between one, if it is one, it's one, and so on and so forth. Where if it's between four and six, it is four. So this becomes not only this is very intuitive to the uh, the business analyst, but he can quickly identify where the logic is, open it up, and take a quick look at it. Right now, moving further, um, he can he can go down and look at this sub decision, and say, "Ha, huh, now." If you remember in the health score, um, what was what was shown was the fact that uh, the input variable was the length of stay of the current encounter. So very quickly, the informaticist can go here and see, oh, how how is the system calculating the current encounter? So here he can go here and like say, hey, here's a decision node which um, executes the current encounter. Um, and so he can quickly uh, look at the logic. This is a field expression, which basically steps through all the encounters and picks the encounter where the encounter number is the current encounter number. It's as simple as that. And then obviously in order to compute the encounter number, you need something like a current encounter number and a list of encounters. So as you can see, um, uh, as you can see that this becomes very easy 
for a clinical informaticist as a business analyst to look at the model and to understand the parts and pieces of the model. Just to round it up, the things with ovals are called inputs to the model. These boxes are decisions, and decisions feed into further decisions till you get the final decision. Okay. Uh, an interesting thing here is um, uh, something called a function. Now, remember, I told you about um, about how uh, how uh, you can. Uh, there's a common occurring pattern in healthcare where the last occurring result needs to be computed quite often. In this case, there's a similar here. In this case, when you look at the diagnosis of a patient and you look at the conditions, based on the conditions, there is a mapping between the condition and the, something called a Charleston score. This is another kind of a risk score which captures the comorbidity uh, sc uh, based risk of a patient. And I can, and so this is interesting. This is a reusable function which can be invoked uh, from here. And this is once I've specified and I can show you the partial Charleston score, um, the decision logic. And this is a decision table which says that if I have myocardial infarction, which is heart attack, the score is one. If I have dementia, the score is one, and so on and so forth. Once I've created the table, I don't need. I don't need to uh, do it again and again. I can store it as a function and invoke it by a decision node. This is the invocation link, the dotted arrow. And not only that, it can be reused in other models created by other people. Okay. So this is a, a high level overview of the, the LACE model. And I would like you to contrast the LACE model with the view you see here. Okay, so let me show you. I would like you to see the, the, the complexity of the LACE model of representation and the complexity of, and contrasted with the complexity of the representation here. Um, now, not only is this, um, is this very, um, whatchamacallit, uh, very easy and intuitive to understand, but it is also executable. Let's execute this model, okay? Let me execute this model. Now, we know that um, now this decision node is waiting on input because you need to input these variables, current encounter number and a list of encounters. So I'm going to input them. I'm going to input a number one, two, three, four. And, um, I have a list of encounters with me and I can basically, what I can do is I can import them from somewhere and I can, you know, this, uh, this is my test set stored somewhere and um, I can close it and I can run it. Give it a minute as it is running through the logic. And as you can see the final, uh, encounter was returned. Um, it computed the length of stay as six days. Now, I would like you to just think of, over what happened. There was no IT person involved. Um, a, a business analyst or a clinical informaticist created the test cases and stored it using a spreadsheet. The same model which was created and was visually understandable is now being executed in real time even if though in a test scenario, right? So uh, this is powerful. What this means is the first level of unit testing for a model or for a clinical decision support logic can be done by the clinical informaticist or the business analysts themselves. Uh, the second level where you integrate it with the enterprise system, that's integration testing. That will, of course, require some IT, right? Let's move on. Let's look at the L score. Now, if you remember, the current encounter length of stay feeds into the L score. So let's click on the L score and execute that. Uh, I'm going to go and run it. Let's give it some time. Now, as you can see, uh, it has evaluated to four. And this is the beauty of uh, 
DMN, it can tell you why it is four. So if you can see the row in the decision table gets highlighted. And the reason it's four is because the length of stay was between four days here and six days here. So not only am I able to uh, execute it, but I'm able to see at each step what executed and why that particular result was returned. We will see later when Simon does the demo that even at runtime, when you're computing, when you're computing the list score, you can see the the audit trail uh, of why that list score was generated. Okay, so this is I think uh, this is where I think DMN begins to address um, one of the transparency related problems we are seeing with machine learning nowadays. Um, more on that later. Okay. So uh, what did we do so far? Um, we, auth we authored the model and we defined and tested the model. Okay, now if you notice, I kind of did not, uh, I'm going to now step through the first four boxes which talk about reuse and search and reuse. Because I think when it comes to time to market, and when it, when it comes to maybe standardization of logic and reuse, I think that's the, the ease of reuse and standardization is the, one of the most uh, productivity enhancing parts of DMN. So I'm going to show you how easy it is to reuse uh, the enterprise data model for logic data elements. So I can go back here and uh, I'm going to stop this for now. Go back to the model. Um, and then what I can do is I can go to my data types and imagine these data types were not there. I can do an import XSD. I can select an XSD. So I'm assuming your enterprise data model is specified as an XML schema document. I can open it up and, uh, you know, you can see the data types here. So it's as easy as that to import all the data types from your enterprise data model. Now, obviously your XML schema will have far more number of data elements here. So you can use this to delete it, right? Uh, or you can, and if something is missing, you can create a new data type, okay? Um, uh, I don't think we have enough time to get into this, but um, uh, I hope it's easy to understand. The next, the next element of reuse now is is the ability to search for pre-existing decisions and decision services. So let's say I want to create a new version of the LACE core decision, right? Let me open up another uh, another thing, right? I'm going to uh, create a new decision, which I'm going to call as my lace score and i know for a fact that uh, you know someone did create an l score in one of the models but even if i don't know i can say hey has anyone created an l score in one of the earlier models so i can go here and i can say hey let me search for l score l score and oh it looks like i have i have quite a few options here so I can say, okay, I'm going to use this option and I'm going to put it here. Now, the interesting part is you're not, you're not only reusing the decision, but you're also reusing the whole sub decisions and the data elements. Let me show you what I mean by that. So let me uh, build this new model and I can expand it because it pulls in the whole thing. Now, if you remember, the L score was based on the current encounter decision node which was based on the, uh, you know, in, these are the inputs to that decision node. And see, now what you have done is you have included without, you've saved so much work. You've gone, you've searched, you know this is the L score you want, you dragged and dropped it in, and you included it in your model. So you don't have, you know, you've leveraged someone else's work here. There's another, uh, another aspect. Now, say, this is reusing within the context of DMN, but what if you want to set up a service and you, you, you figure out that L score is really, really important to the enterprise and you want to set up a service 
uh, for the rest of the enterprise so that they can, you, you want to set up a rest endpoint or whatever you want to do. And so that anyone could call for uh, the health core service from outside, um, outside, uh, outside the DMN, uh, you know, tool and directly from a different application. So what I would do is I would encapsulate the list uh, the else core within a, a service. Uh, so this is the output decision of the service. These are the encapsulated decisions. This, this may be more than one, and these are the inputs to the service. So very quickly, I have created, uh, and let me call it the else core service. Okay. So very quickly, I have created a service. Uh, I have, I can publish it to my service catalog, and it appears here. This is a score service, and it it is well documented. It has these inputs, it has these encapsulated decisions, and this is the output decision. Okay, so okay, so uh, close. Okay, so this is another powerful way of reusing um, uh, decisions, even across the context of DMN. Now, any enterprise application can invoke this else core service, parse, and input these two parameters and get your value back, right? Now, coming to the old issue, remember when we are stepping through uh, the the, uh, the decisions in the, in, the, in, the, in the demo I was doing, I talked about transparency. And one of the things that machine learning models lack today is transparency. How about if we were able to add a machine learning model and you know i can say i'm adding a new decision which is basically a machine learning model telling the thing uh, now i'm going to show you uh, i can't uh, i don't have enough time to show the demo but i can quickly show you how it can be done so i can uh, I can do, I can create decision logic, invocation function. And now here, um, I can get the, uh, the machine learning output from either by, remember we, we showed you an example of scene, but you can actually include a PMML file, which can be executed, the document and the model, or you can include a Java file. Now, Interestingly, this is the Java file, basically the Java function basically can encapsulate a call to a REST API. Now, an interesting thing about uh, um, Azure machine learning and other machine learning platforms is now they all provide a way of exposing machine learning models as services through REST APIs. So you can basically call that machine learning model either to this approach or if they're represented as PML, you, you can be called here. Now here's the interesting part of, uh, of DMN, right? So uh, you have a machine learning model, all of a sudden you have now transparency uh, across your rules and your machine learning models. So uh, there's more work which needs to be done this way. Uh, maybe we need to figure out uh, ways to break up the machine learning model to make it more visible and transparent. But I think DMN provides a fascinating approach for both reusability and transparency. Okay, moving on. So what what have we done so far? We have basically shown you a way of re reusing pre-existing decisions and decision services. Now, this is interesting. Uh, I'm going to show you these two things together. Uh, reuse of pre-curated concept sets and uh, and uh, parameterized functions. Now, I'm sure these uh, are relevant other domains as well, uh, but uh, here's what I'm going to show you. So, going back to the original model, this is uh, this is an interesting decision node. If you see the thing which says ICD10 value set, it has no input at all. So, all it does actually 
if you open it up, and I can open it up for you. Uh, this more pages. So what, let me describe what this is. This is basically a huge table of collections of concepts. Each column in the table corresponds to a disease condition. And each element in the in the column corresponds to uh, an ICD-10 code. Okay. Yeah, no, let me just show my slides instead. Luckily, this is what slides are for. Um, so this is how the table looks like. Uh, this is uh, this is the ICD-10 value set. If uh, I hadn't killed the process, I'd, as Simon said, um, I, these are how the code sets. Each column corresponds to a disease condition, and um, this disease condition, uh, this is basically uh, uh, a set of codes, right? Now it's interesting. Once I define the set, I can store it in a decision node, and as we saw, this decision node can then be reused across multiple models. And this is how you can access a particular set. You can say ICD-10 value set dot the column name. And then in the decision table, the code, the membership of this particular code, which is fed into this table, will be automatically checked. And if that code is a member of the set, you know that patient has myocardial infarction. The other example I, I talked about was parameterized functions. Uh, I will have to. Uh, this is this is the example when we uh, I should have been able to. So uh, this is a prior encounter. This is a function which basically computes, given a set of encounters and an, and an index encounter, it computes the prior encounter of of that encounter. Now, in this case, we are interested in a prior encounter of the current encounter. So. We don't have to re recode this logic. So someone may be interested in a prior encounter of some admission encounter or prior encounter of the discharge, whatever, some, some other kind of index encounter. So we don't have to uh, recode the logic again and again. All we have to do is create a parameterized function uh, for prior encounter, and this is how you define it. The prior encounter function takes as input, an input encounter and an encounter list, and has a field expression. And when you invoke it, you basically, in this case, since you're interested in the prior encounter, the current encounter, you pass current encounter as one of the inputs, and then uh, you pass encounters as the next input. All right. So, so just to recap, what have I done so far? We have we have stepped through the uh, the CDS lifecycle, and now uh, I'm going to hand over the screen uh, we're going to show you how to deploy it uh, at uh, at runtime and I'm going to hand over the demo to Simon he will uh, show you how he has uh, deployed the same BMN model which I showed you uh, in runtime using CDS hooks so over to you Simon thank you yeah thank you Vipo um, so basically uh, I'm guessing we can see my screen now Uh, yes, 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 very well. Okay. Sorry. All right. So um, basically, we have the same model that Vipul showed. He showed how we can test this execution based on Excel data, make sure that the model is sound and do uh, what you want. But we can even go further than that and directly integrate with EHR systems uh, through the standard that Vipul talked about called CDS hooks, which is an automated or a standardized way of integrating decision systems such as our TriStack Cloud execution that supports the uh, CDS standard. So basically, the only thing that remains to do is, for instance, go to the diagnosis here and bind a fire query. So that's part of the standard saying that, okay, my, my diagnosis, I'm going to get them from my uh, medical system under condition where the patient is the current patient that I'm looking at. And I do that for the encounters as well. Now, once I publish that to my uh, TriStack Cloud execution, I'm going to get a uh, new service in my service library. Now, this is publishes is now accessible to everyone in the business. And uh, if I look at it, I have my documentation, uh, all that. And 
under my advanced options, I have the CDS hook integration that I can use here and take that URL and simply connect it to my EHR system so that uh, the EHR system can communicate with the decision and it will return cards. If we uh, remember, uh, we had that uh, system here that we pull uh, talk that the EHR system talk to the CDS service uh, that will fetch the data, send it to the engine and return cards, information cards about uh, the decision that was made. So if we uh, look at it, I'm going to be using a uh, mocked uh, EHR system uh, provided by the uh, HSPC uh, group. They have created something really nice called the CDS hook sandbox to demonstrate integration from uh, an EHR system with uh, a decision system such as ours. So basically how it works is uh, you have different uh, patient data and you just uh, launch the uh, CDS and you choose your patient. So for instance, I'm gonna choose uh, Adam Daniel here. So behind the scene, what's gonna happen, it's uh, gonna fetch my information and it's going to present to me the different cards. We're seeing them here. So, for instance, this patient, uh, I'm going to show the lay score with intermediate results. I could have decided to just show the lay score, but we wanted to have all the different steps that uh, people showed in the animation. So I have a lay score of two for Daniel, uh, uh, L score of zero. I can go into the detail. Yes, no uh, ED visit is two is coming from his uh, condition. So this guy has diabetes with complication. That's why he's getting a score of two. If we were to run this on a different patient, for instance, uh, Aaron Alexis here, who gets a score of five because this guy have a metallic solid, uh, metastatic solid tumor. So we can see all this uh, information and we can imagine this being displayed to uh, the physician in the uh, EHR system. Another great benefit that uh, people also uh, alluded to is that everything that is done through DMN is fully traceable and auditable. So if I go into the uh, trace log of the uh, cloud execution, we can see the two patients that I've ran here where I can see the, re the result that they got here, for instance, both of their results. I also have the information on what was submitted and we can configure the trace of the server so that we can keep this data for analysis. Then it, the last step in this methodology is to compare the results with the real feedback. So the lay score uh, is used as a risk factor for uh, the risk of readmitting someone or him dying within 30 days, uh, which means that if we gather also the data um, of whether or not he was readmitted or died within 30 days, we can then analyze based on the audit traces provided by the DMN execution uh, and get feedback on uh, how the lay score was on point or not uh, at predicting uh, what it's supposed to predict and then go back to um, the model and then tweak it to get a better score. So uh, Vipul, I think you wanted to do a little conclusion of all that. Yes, quickly, thank you. If I can share my screen. I'm guessing Jonathan has to, yeah. Yes. Uh, so very quickly, I'm going to go back to the model again. And if you remember what uh, Simon showed you, what he showed you was the current encounter. He showed you, uh, I think, uh, the number of, he showed you the L score, the A score, the C score, the E score. He showed the Charleston comorbid score. So essentially, what whichever of these nodes which were activated, he was able to, at runtime, he was not only able to give you the final lay score, but he was able to give you the values of all this. Now, this is fabulous for transparency because at runtime, you have, the physician can see why a system is making that recommendation. It can look at the sub-decisions and give more information to the physician. 
Now, if one of these boxes is a machine learning model, the physician has uh, the output of the machine learning model as well. So uh, I'm going to, end, uh, so this is uh, it. Um, I'm going to talk about some, we are in the middle of um, up a white paper. Uh, please share your contact details uh, and we will send you that white paper. Um, and this is my contact information. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions feedback, suggestions, and opportunities for collaboration. Uh, with this, I think Simon and I conclude our demo and presentation. Uh, thanks for your time. I look forward to your uh, questions. All right. Thank yeah. you. So I'm guessing you have some uh, questions uh, uh, that yes. came up during the uh, presentation. So uh, exactly. go ahead and me and Vipul will take them for, Perfect. I would say, about 10, 10 minutes. Uh, yes. Well, we we have uh, we have uh, actually three questions that we'll go through. Um, okay. We received a few uh, concerning the the slides and the recordings. So uh, everyone that's still listening, uh, we will provide this uh, in a follow up email, so you can expect it uh, later today or or at the latest uh, tomorrow. So uh, this being said, our first question here from. Uh, Elaine asking uh, about BPMN deployment. So her question just goes as, uh, has BPMN been deployed? So I don't know if you can uh, elaborate on that. Uh, sure. Uh, actually, the same pattern, the exact same pattern is possible with BPMN as well. Uh, the Tristec um, do also uh, BPMN modeling. So we can do the, the same integration pattern with uh, BPMN as well. Um, we just wanted to focus this presentation on decision uh, modeling, but uh, yeah, it's possible to do that with the process modeling as well. Okay, perfect, thanks. Um, so we have a second question here uh, from Susanna uh, asking, um, is there any correlation with the uh, with Azure machine learning? So I know you mentioned it. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Vipo. So let me... Uh... Yes, thank you. Uh, so if you're looking at the screen right now, um, let me go back and um, I'm going to um, delete this. I'm going to create a new decision node for you. And if you remember my demo, uh, decision logic, um, you can actually invoke a function from within your decision node. And remember, these are our two options. So. One thing I do know about Azure, Azure machine learning is that, uh, and I've played around with it myself, uh, you, they uh, provide you with the ability to expose the, the something they call as a prediction service uh, through a REST API. And so what we can do through DMN is um, have a wrapper Java function, which could directly call uh, and specify the class and the method signatures and that you know and with the function parameters whatever you want you know you can specify the parameters here and then you can call the zero machine learning uh, function directly from here um hope that answers your question yeah. uh, also if i may add a little bit on the machine learning um so machine learning in general is uh referred as a uh, black box algorithm of uh, analyzing the input and giving a an output. So DMN is really positioned as being a white box uh, version of that, meaning that you can explain exactly how the decision is made. So yes, as Vipul said, we can integrate also black box AI such as um, the ones coming out of Azure, but also what's interesting is that the DMN or the decision management approach as a whole, is a transparent solution when audit is important, where governance is important, where you can uh, exactly uh, see how the decision was made. So basically, machine learning and decision management are not, uh, I would say, um, one or another, but uh, they are different approach to uh, solving similar problems. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for uh, the answer. So we have we, we have a, a few more that came up. Um, so we have one here from Keith uh, asking, how do you foresee, and this one probably uh, 
more addressed to uh, Vipul. Uh, how do you foresee leveraging these models in the context of existing HR solution at the point of care? Yes, so that's, uh, that's exactly what we tried to demonstra demonstrate to you today. Let me take you back to the CDS hooks diagram again. So uh, on, on your left is the EMR interface. Um, the physician puts a medication order entry. Uh, there, are, there are multiple types of CDS hooks defined in the uh, standard. One is patient view. Uh, one is medication order entry, and there's another one called order review. So each of these CDS hooks automatically trigger a, a call to the remote service. So once, it, uh, once uh, the remote service endpoint is known to the CDS hook, it just triggers a call to it, and that's it. This is your integration point. The rest of the thing is done by the protocol. You refetch the data from the fire server. This, the data sent over also includes uh, uh pointer to the fire server there's a prefetch call it gets the patient data runs the logic and then returns these cards as i showed you so yes um uh, this is the this is uh, the data uh, this is how we plan to integrate uh the dmn models into uh, a clinical workflow at the point of care hopefully that addresses your question yeah i think so Pretty clear. Um, we have we still have a bit of time, so let's go with uh, let's take another one. Uh, so we have David here asking, um, how much time did it take? It's more of a practical question here. So how much time did it take to uh, to train the clinical informist informaticists uh, on how to create uh, models, rules, and and everything? So just you know to apply this uh, this new approach. Coach. Yes. Yeah, so this is interesting. Um, uh, I can give you some information here. We had uh, uh, two cases. I showed you an example of the LACE model, but we also we had also in, uh, um, uh, implemented uh, a decision support model for acute kidney injury. Uh, that acute kid kidney injury basically evaluates whether a patient is a candidate for AKI, and if a patient is a candidate for AKI, it it stages the patient actually using two algorithms. One is the Vanderbilt algorithm proposed by University of Vanderbilt and an algorithm proposed by UK NHS. Um, so that took us a long, long time to implement. That took us like two months to implement and test. That same developer, without any training, we asked him to do the DMN model. And of course, he had to just read up the DMN model. He looked around with examples. And within a week, he had the AKI model, the first version of the AKI model running. He was able to, and I can show you the model here, actually. Let me see if I can open it up. Um, and I'm assuming David is, uh, is with a clinical background, so um, uh, he would appreciate what I'm showing you. So this is the AKI model, and um, it was it was much simpler than the rules-based approach. He was able to rapidly create it and test it within a week. You know, he did the same thing. He did the decision animator and so on and so forth. Okay, so so we noticed uh, what we call is a 10x improvement in the authoring time. Okay. Now another interesting thing is. Previously, when the rules were authored, they were so IT uh, they were so IT oriented rules, as as you saw in the, in the in the slide, that we had to get a QA person to specify the test cases. In this case, the business analyst slash clinical informaticist was able to specify and test the test cases himself, as you saw in the demo. Right? That's advantage number two. The the third step is where. Uh, this is where IT got involved, where we had to integrate it with the backend systems, with the EMR, with getting the actual data from the EMR and uh, integrating in the clinical workflow. So that that is integration testing. So I don't think we, we save too much there, but I would say if you were to average out, I think we at least had a 50% savings in time. And I mean, uh, if, if you drop down the authoring time from two months to a week, that's huge. Uh, add another week for testing, so I would say two months to two weeks. Uh, that's that's great because um, if you if you know one of the key advantages is once all the data types are defined, uh, 
I don't have to actually write code. I just have to write and configure decision logic and maybe write some field expressions. So that was it. Didn't take us much take us much time. Yeah, so and and just... if I may, uh, you know, the DMN is created you know, to be uh, rapidly learned. I, I've taken a DMN course myself and I'm not definitely not a coder, not a developer. And, and uh, you know, I was able to create solid uh, decision models within, uh, you know, a few hours of, with a few hours only of training. So, uh, and, and there are training available. We have uh, our colleague, Bruce Silver, who's doing uh, online training. We do offer also, uh, Tristec also offers uh, training. So it's, it, it's, it's really meant to be used by, uh, you know, the, the people that are hands on. So, uh, but I, I think you've, you've illustrated this very, very well. So we, we still have a, a few questions, but uh, I think the uh, uh, we're coming to the end of our timing. So since those questions remaining are, are a little bit more specific, maybe we can address them uh, directly. So I will thank you very much, Vipul, for being with us uh, today. Uh, same thing for Simon. Thanks for uh, the demo. Do you, have, do you guys have any last words? So... Uh... I hope you don't mind I'm jumping in, but I'm pretty excited about this, and I would encourage uh, the people who are on the call to reach out with their, with uh, with the kinds of DMN model stuff they're doing, whether it be in healthcare and non-healthcare, uh, and uh, would love to, let's get into a collaboration and let's start building these models together and see where we can take them. I think this has huge promise, and uh, I, I would look forward to keeping in touch with all of you and collaborating with you. Perfect, and I will. I will also share your information uh, to to everyone that had registered for for the webinar, so that uh, we make make sure that everybody can keep in touch and we can and we can continue working uh, on on these. Yes, please do. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, guys, and uh, everyone that's been listening. Thank you for being here, and uh, to the next webinar. Bye bye.